small. Don't you love your little boy? Don't you love your little girl? Don't you want them to grow up and really know the truth? Now over there in 1 John 2, 15, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Parents, do you want your child? Everything that your child does, everything that your child loves, everything that your child gets involved in, do you want all of that to pass away? Now, my friend, you don't want that to happen. If children are uh, taught to love the world, when they get up, when they grow up, they're going to likely continue in the world, in the world systems without Jesus Christ. No matter how exciting the things of this world are, they cannot give peace and satisfaction to the soul. Did you know, my friend, that all the things of the world that are so enticing and so beautiful, and it just looks like, man, there are so many things in our world to enjoy. I mean, so many things to do. It's amazing how our world is filled with all kinds of fun. Now, there's nothing wrong with a ball game, nothing wrong with a car race, nothing wrong with some of these things within themselves, but some people absolutely worship uh, their ball team more than they love God. I mean, they'll argue, they'll fuss, they'll fight you over their ball team, but they don't get shook up a little bit when somebody downs Jesus Christ. Well, I tell you, I'm not going to fight you over a ball game. I'm not going to argue with you over Clemson or Carolina or Furman or anybody else. I don't care what you believe about them. But when it comes to Jesus, don't bring me some kind of false God and try to get me to go along with that. I'm jealous for Jesus and I'm going to preach Jesus and I, I want to stand up for him. He's the one that saved this wretched soul uh, uh, 50 years ago uh, and put the Holy Ghost in me and brother he's the one that I'm jealous for and zealous for as well. Now no matter how exciting the world things are they cannot satisfy that soul. That little child will grow up miserable. He'll grow up with mental problems sometime and they'll grow up and they are frustrated and they get on alcohol and dope and all this other stuff thinking that's a way out and then soon they find out that's not the way out but sometimes they get addicted to that and then it's hard to get off if some of them never do get off of that stuff. And some people say, well do you believe they're all lost? I'm not going to believe that. I don't believe believe they're all lost. I'm telling you, your flesh is not worth anything. And you can be saved right now as you can possibly be. And you go out here and start smoking dope and all that kind of stuff. And your old body will respond. And it'll get addicted. It'll get addicted whether you're saved or not. And some saved people that I know, they get right with God. They dedicate their life to the Lord. They live for God a while. And after they live for God a while, they what you call fall off the wagon again. Listen, my friend, it's because that flesh is no good. You can't let the flesh have its way. That's the reason you've got to train children to know that it's wrong to do certain things because the flesh can't take it later on. It'll get addicted to it. You might not agree with me on everything I say, but I'll back it up with the Word of God. I'm telling you, no matter how this old world comes at you and allures you, you better stay away. Now, things of the world have to keep changing. They keep on changing every day to satisfy those that are involved in the things of the world. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world. Jesus said you can't find peace in that world. You can do everything you want to. You can try everything the world offers, but you'll never have peace in your heart until you come to me. But when you come to me, I'll give you peace, not like the world, but peace, hallelujah, and your heart will not have to be troubled anymore. Now if parents would dedicate themselves to Jesus Christ and properly instruct their children of the vanity of this present world system and the victories which they can have in Jesus Christ, it would be a blessing. It would be a blessing. Parents, it is not enough just to tell your children of Jesus and the awful consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ, but 
They need to see an exemplary life. They, see, they need to see Jesus in you, mama and daddy, not all that nagging and fussing and cussing and carrying on in the home. They don't need to see that. They need to see prayer. They need to see singing. They need to, uh, they need to see Bible reading. They need to see some Christianity in the home, not just in church. Uh, they can tell a hypocrite from uh, anybody else that makes a mistake. They know when, a, when you're a hypocrite. So if parents do not live a dedicated Christian life, then of course the children are going to know that they are full of hypocrisy. Now you remember Lot. And Lot, when God told him to get out of Sodom and said, we're going to destroy this place. And then Lot went out and tried to convince his sons-in-law that they need to get out. God's going to destroy this place. And they thought Lot was some kind of fool. They thought he was mocking because, see, he was saved. The Bible bears out he was a just man, but he had stayed in Sodom so long and lived a backslidden life that his own sons-in-law could not recognize him as a saved person, and they perished because they couldn't believe their father-in-law. Let me tell you something. If you don't live it, you better not expect your kids to live it because they most likely will not. But if you live it, praise God, God promises you train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Somebody said, well, I raised my child for God and he departed from it. No, you missed it somewhere along the line. You weren't dedicated. You put something else ahead of God. You put yourself ahead of God somewhere along the line. I mean, if you trace it down, I don't want to have to name it out now. I don't have to spill it out. This is Brother Joe Blow. Now I'm going to show you what you're seeing here. I can write it out up here. But see, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to preach and you're supposed to listen. And when God speaks to your heart, don't throw it over to somebody else. Take it in. Do something about it. We got people sitting here right now that need to straighten up. We got some parents here that need to wise up. Some of you got self in mind. Self, self, self. Satisfy me. I'm the baby. I'm the baby. You sure are. But you need to grow up. You need to grow up, praise God, and not worry so much about whether people treat you right or not and start treating those kids right and praying for those kids and laboring with those kids. That's what you need to do. Parents, wake up before it's too late. I can't stand these little crybabies anyhow. I'm telling you, they're sickening. I want this, I want it my way. And then some of you think, praise God, you're jealous of everybody. Jealous. If you're jealous of anybody, you're not right with God. You're not right with God. Don't tell me, preacher, I'm not right with God. I'm telling you right now, you're not right with God. God, the sweet Holy Ghost, wouldn't let you be jealous of somebody. I mean, hey, I can't be the prettiest man in this place. But just because Joe Blow's prettier than I am, I'm not going to get jealous of him. So he ain't got some other things I got. Hallelujah. I mean, hey, he ain't got the teeth I got. I mean, I broke mine, and that dentist said, looked at me Thursday, and he said, how old is this partial? And I said, 30 or 40 years old. He said, I thought so. He said, I can't fix it, but I can order you a new one. I said, okay, how much? $1,600. I said, that's good. That's what I need. Man, for a partial. And I get it in 13 days or more. Boy, I tell you right now, you don't be jealous of anybody. Don't be jealous of anybody. Hey, you got everything. You ought to be shouting that you're able to sit here, hallelujah. If you've got children, hey, you ought to be praising God for these children. Don't you just love your child? Praise God. Don't waste your time being jealous of anybody. Parents need to wake up and be a real testimony for the Lord. Give your children a holy and a joyful atmosphere in which to live and grow up in. Parents love each other and show each other love. You say, well, I just can't be emotional. Yeah, you can. And I just can't be mushy. Yeah, you can. You better get mushy before it gets squishy. <laughs> Amen. You better get mushy. You better come on cross now and start loving your husband, loving your wife, and quit this thing of being all divided. There's no sense in that. And I've been down the road, Ann and sitting here, my wife, she knows I'm telling you the truth. We've been down the road. We had to learn the hard way because nobody taught us. We had to learn from this, but we learned from this. And I'm here with a little bit of experience to tell you, praise God, fussing is a waste of time. Arguing is a waste of time. Pouting is a waste of time. I'd rather have a doubter than a powder. I can't stand a powder either. 
Man, they make me sick. The lips stuck out. Man, if it were to rain, it'd fill their whole mouth up. Yeah. Admonition. Admonition coupled with godly living will surely help train your child in the way that he should go. When Paul was writing to young Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 1.5, when I call to remember, it's the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first, listen to this, which dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and in thy mother, Eunice. I am persuaded that in thee also. Hey, listen, my friend, that Timothy had real faith that Paul commended, but he didn't just commend his faith. He commended his mother's faith, his grandmother's faith. And you know what? I'm telling you right now, good parent, and you have faith, you live faith, and you teach it to your children, they'll grow up and they'll love God Almighty. And whenever the devil comes in and tries to tempt them to go astray, they'll say no, because you've instilled in them that that's the devil coming to try to distract you, trying to get you sidetracked. So I have had people to say to me, on occasion, why are there so many preachers in your family? And I don't know. I know God calls most of them. I think some of them are not called, but some of them are. But I don't know the full answer for that, but I know one thing that helped it along, I believe, is a good godly mama that used to pray for all of her kids and her grandkids and pray for God to bless them and God to use them. My mother was a good, solid Christian. She was quiet. She wasn't loud. She wasn't noisy. She didn't show out, but praise God, she could pray. She knew how to talk to God, and she'd talk to God about her children and ask God to save them. Had eight children that made professions of faith. And she had all kinds of in-laws and outlaws that got saved, and many of them are preaching today, preaching the Word of God. Mama's in heaven now. One day soon, I'm going to see her. And I don't know how the rewards are going to be. Let me hurry on. But I tell you, you just raise your child right. There's a quiet, there's a quiet and a peaceable spirit that we can have, and not a noisy, ungodly, ungodly spirit. God and man's corrections of children is right. Now, how do you know that, preacher? All right, it's not my opinion. Let me read it to you. Hebrews 12, 9. We have fathers, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in submission unto the Father of spirits and live? Now, see, we've been corrected by our parents, and God said, that's right. It helped us. Listen, some say, I don't believe in spanking a child. Well, the way some spank, I don't either. The way some do it, you don't know how to do it. Come on, you're going to have to learn, parents, how to act right and how to spank a child. Now, listen to this. The way some people spank, you just can't go along with it. I don't believe you ought to backhand a child. I don't believe you ought to slap him on the ear. I don't believe you ought to do any of that foolish stuff. Say so some of you parents, you, don't, you haven't learned that yet. Some of you will slap. Now, if a parent spanks a child and do it, does it right, it's in order. Now, let me show you in the Bible. Hebrews 12, 11. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Proverbs 13, 24, the Bible says, he that spareth his rod, and that's not a wagon rod, some, you know, an iron rod to knock somebody down with. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a hickory, a little thing to spank with. He said, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him. If you don't chasten your son or your daughter when they need to be chastened, you don't love them. The Bible says, all right, in Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Every child has foolishness born in him, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. If you'll correct that child correctly now, if you know how to do it, and you better learn to do it, and don't act a fool, no, sir, but correct him right, then you're going to find out that it's going to drive that foolishness out of him. I've seen two-year-olds and three-year-olds say no, no, to their mom and daddy. If I'd have said that, I wouldn't be preaching to you today. I wouldn't. I would have been in the graveyard. 
because daddy didn't know how to spank. He'd kill you. He was some rough customer. But let me tell you something. A kid that says no, you ought to just take him right then. Take him to the back room and talk to him. Tell him what a sweet little boy he is. Be so sweet and kind to him. Say, but if you ever say that again, you're going to think I'm the devil because I'm going to put it on you, boy. And give him another chance. Then if it says no, on his rear end. That's what God put that back there for. Because you can't kill him. But you can make him sting. And you can make him squirm. Boy, I never will forget when I was in high school, agriculture, Tom Crenshaw straightened every wayward boy out at Malden School. All other teachers couldn't handle him. They'd send him to Tom Crenshaw. Well, I got in his class. He come in with a big old paddle that big with holes in it. Said, I got something here, boys. I'll straighten any of you out. And I shoot, that thing wouldn't hurt a fly. He said, come here, Sammy. And I went up there. I opened my mouth too quickly. He said, bend over that desk. Whew. He put three licks on me. And I'm not lying yet. When I got back, I could not sit down. And I learned right then Tom Crenshaw was tougher than I was. And I never did argue with that man again. He would straighten you out. But see, he blistered me. He let me know, you're not going to run over me in this class. You may run over other people. You're not running over me. And I didn't for the rest of that class. Matter of fact, I fell in love with that old man. I thought the world of him. He's my friend. All right, but now Proverbs says, the rod of reproof gives wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Take any issue that you choose in life, and there's a right and there's a wrong. I must hurry up. The home. Father is head of the home. Now, if you want me to go into all these scriptures, it'll take all day. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, that according to the Bible, the Father is the head of the house. You might not like that lady, and you women's livers, I know you don't, but I don't care about you. You're crazy anyhow. <laughs> Father is the head of the house. And the mother is the keeper of the home. Children are an heritage of the Lord. All this is in the scripture now. And children are a blessing from God. The entire family needs to know these facts and adhere to them. Everybody in the home ought to adhere to them. And some little smart aleck woman would say, well, I ain't letting my husband tell me what to do. You ought to be slapped. But see, I can't slap you, but he can't either because he'll go to jail, but God can. See, God won't have to go to jail when he puts it on you. So don't be so smart aleck, little lady. Quit being so smart aleck. Uh -huh. Come on, men. You need to grow a few beer whiskers too. Yeah. And you be the man of the house. You take hold at that home. Take hold of it. And tell your wife, now let's sit down and talk this over. In love, in love, now I'm going to take over my home and you're going you're gonna to submit to me. Now, I'm not talking about you ride over her like she's a slave and she can't say anything, she can't do anything. That's a bunch of bunk. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you as a dad. Read this scripture right here. And who does he talk to in Ephesians? Start with fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Fathers, fathers. So, Father, you need to take hold of your home right now. Amen. And then, of course, I could go on. And if you oppose these things, you're opposing the Word of God. And that is blasphemy against the Word. Then the church would take the church. I thought somebody was sneaking up behind me there. I said, oh, man, I done had it. <laughs> Woo, boy, I'm going crazy up here. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do this, but I had to. But you got your church. The Bible tells us we ought to know how to uh, behave ourselves in the house of God. Boy, that's another thing we need to all learn, how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Now, we are to have reverence and respect to the house of God. We ought to treat it right. It's not a holy place. I mean, it's, not, uh, nothing, it's nothing but a building. It's a building, but it's sanctified, set apart for the worship of our holy Savior. That's what it is. So it ought to be respected. Children ought to be allowed to tear it up and to do damage to it. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 17, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 19, 18, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Oh, I whipped him and he cried. Well, what do you expect? God said, don't let that bother you. They're going to cry, but you correct them anyway. Don't let him run, just run uh, rampant in the house of God or anywhere else. Firm discipline filled with grace and mercy should characterize every mama and daddy. 
Just because the Bible teaches uh, dis, uh, discipline in the home and chastisement doesn't mean that a, sh- a child should have a spanking every time they do something wrong. That doesn't mean, and I've seen idiot parents, that's what they are. Every time a child does anything wrong, the least bit, they're slapped or they're hit or they're spoken to sharply. And uh, parents just scare the daylights out of those little children. You don't do that. That's not the way you discipline a child. A child ought to love being around you. I see some of these little children go up and hug their daddy and their mama and say, Mom and Daddy, I love you. Now, boy, that shows me somebody's not making them afraid. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Back in my young days, I was afraid to come home at times because I didn't know where I'd be welcome in or how I was going to be kicked out. I didn't know. But I'll tell you right now, when I got my kids, I never did make them uh, afraid to come home. They, they came home, and I was glad to see them every time they came home. I'm telling you, I got three here, four here today, three or four here today, and uh, they're grown, got their own kids and all, and I still love to see them come to my house. I love it. Chastisement is for persistent rebellion, not everyday blunders. Children make blunders. All of them. It's the way of life. You don't whip them for everything they do wrong. You just, when they persist and persist, God will warn us before he chastens us. But after we disobey and disobey and disobey, then he'll lay the lash on. And my friend, this attitude of discipline is opposed to the spirit of God. When you have that old ugly spirit, this kind of discipline hardens that child against you and against his own self. He gets to where he's sick of himself. I can't do anything right. I don't know how to do anything. And he gets a complex. Remember, provoke not, provoke not your children to wrath. Many children who might have been saved by careful godly training in their early years have been made to dread and to hate their own parents and want to be away from them and leave home. Now to leave a child to himself will cause him to become worse and worse to be heartless and use unnecessary and cruel beatings and whippings will drive that child deeper into bitterness. So you don't want to do that. We must be as wise as serpent and harmless as doves. That's what we're supposed to be. Now he became, uh, uh, when we read about uh, Saul, a good illustration, Saul became angry, so angry at his own son his own son, whenever he, knit, he was knit together with David, Jonathan and David, they were together and loved each other. And uh, Saul got angry at Jonathan, his own son. He got so mad he threw a javelin, tried to kill him. Now, boy, listen, if you don't believe not raising kids for God can lead to something. See, Saul, he didn't care. He didn't care about his son. He didn't care if he killed him because of his jealous self, his jealous self. He was jealous of David. So we can't be jealous. Got to get rid of all jealousy. Love everybody. Appreciate everybody. And love those kids truly. And let's start it, okay? Let's stand our feet and close our eyes for a minute. Now I tell you, this is not a glory sermon. You're not doing a whole lot of shouting, and I understand why. And we do invite anybody here today unsaved. If you want to get saved, you can come get saved because the altar is always open for lost sinners. We invite you to come. 